All right. So control, open loop versus closed loop. In open loop, this is where we are simply telling the talent, output this to the motor. And do not worry what the motor is doing. Duty cycle, that we talked about, or voltage mode are open loop. We're simply telling the motor, here's the power. Motor, you're going to run up and down the speed torque curve depending on what grip is on the shaft. But me as the talent, that's all I'm doing. I have no encoder. I'm blind. I just gave you six volts. I'm a six volt battery, and you're on your own. That's open loop, and you can tell a talent to operate that way in, uh, in duty or voltage. We normally use voltage. Closed loop, where I actually want to make something specific happen. I want to make it run a specific speed, no matter what, or go to a specific position. That's as we talked about. You've got a, a speed mode, a position mode. There's motion magic. There's constant current. There's several different closed loop modes where I've added sensors to make things do a particular defined solution that you've talked to the talent about. Now, as it turns out, the talent needs some help when you say, hey, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to go closed loop, and I'm going to tell you to go this speed. And I've given you an encoder. I want you to run that speed. OK, you might think, well, the talent says, OK, am I going too fast? Yeah, all right, put on 0 volts. Am I going too slow? Put on 12 volts and speed it up. Seems simple. Won't work very well at all because it will oscillate and just be a spaz fest. You actually, as you approach the right speed, you have to start throttling back how hard you're driving the motor and land that thing right at the right speed. And that, that landing rate is heavily influenced by what we call the physical plant. You'll hear that term in, in loop control. The physical plant is the motor, and you need to know its speed torque curve. The encoder, you need to know the rate of data coming out of it. What is its ticks per revolution? And the mechanics of your mechanism. How much inertia is in there? How much drag is in there? All this gets into the equation of the talent knowing, OK, when I'm going to try to get to this speed, I've got to start slowing down at this rate so that when I get to the right speed, I kind of stop right on the dot. I don't end up going, oh, i got to start slowing down. Oh, and I'm not close enough. Sneak, 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 sneak. Now I'm at the right speed. You don't want to do that. You also don't want to say, OK, I, I need to get to the right speed. Full throttle. Here I go. All right, there was the right speed. I really ought to slow down. OK, now we got to get back to the right speed. All right, there's the right speed. Great, wait a minute. I, oh, crap. i got to go back the other way now. If you don't have it programmed right, that's what will happen. We're going to do a little demonstration later here where you're going to see, with humans as encoders and motors, what all happens there. So there are values. And for those paying attention earlier in the class, P, I, and D, and some other things, that's how I tell the talent about my system so it knows how to land that thing right on the spot. And PID, well, how, how complicated could that be? This is all what a PID is. Everybody got that? There will be a test later. And if you fail, no pizza for you. All right. This is nowhere near as bad as it sounds. Um, we're going to spend uh, probably the next uh, 30 minutes going through this. And you're going to feel much better 30 minutes from now. But this does start to get some important stuff. So I'm going to slow down a little bit. And, and if you don't get this, you need to raise your hand, and, and we'll get it explained. Um, when you look at this diagram, the process, the motor and encoder, here is the physical plant. My motor power goes in. That's the output shaft of my motor. And my encoder wires are going back. That's the motor and encoder and the mechanism and all the stuff out there. 
So that is the green and white wire coming from the talon, and that's the wire going back into the talon. All of this is in the talon, and this is the Robo Rio telling the talon how fast to go. So let's simplify this. So what's actually going on here is the talon tells the Robo Rio, I want you to go 100. The talon says, cool, I need to go 100. Okay, encoder, how fast are you going? I need to go 100, how fast are you going? I'm going zero because I'm not turned on. What's wrong with you, Talon? You should know that, but I'm not going anywhere. Okay, the Talon says, I'm supposed to be going 100, I'm going zero, plus, minus. This sums those two and gives me an error. And if I'm supposed to be going 100, and I'm actually going zero, what do we think the error might be? A uh, hundred would be a safe guess. So it's just that simple. How fast should I be going? How fast am I going? The error is the difference between those. I am off a hundred RPM. That value is fed into some math, and the math is this simple. What is my error times my proportional constant and puke that number out here, and that goes down here, and that number is turned into volts for the motor. In the talon, it has a 10-bit D to A for the output. So 1,023 in here gives you 12 volts. Zero in here gives you nothing. And the math is just that simple. In this particular case, if I'm supposed to be going 100, I am going zero. I have an error of 100. I multiply that 100 by whatever this value is. And if that value happens to be 512, which is half of 1023, this thing's going to output 6 volts. Now, if this value is so high that when I multiply that, I have 1,678,000 whatever, this thing is still going to output 12 volts. It can't get past 12 volts. Okay? And so in this side of the talon, what goes on is I say, okay, I want a velocity closed loop. I want the talon to worry about how fast it's going, and the talon, you take care of that for me. Okay, go 100. Right now, my constant is zero. I have an error of 100. 100 times zero is how much output? We're going to get you guys trained. Not a lot, really close to zero. Matter of fact, it turns out it's exactly zero. Okay, so how rapidly is my motor going to accelerate? Not very fast at all. And boredom set in is like watching grass grow. Nothing moves and nobody knows why. Well, it's because I have no value in here to multiply this. Now, let's say I put one in here. Okay, what's 100 times one that gives me 100. We know when this is at 1,000, we'll call it, I'm full speed. So with 100 stuffed in here, I have about 10%. I get about 1.2 volts out here. So OK, I got 1.2 volts. This motor starts to speed up. Is this value 0? Nope. That value is now going to start to speed up. But let's say, for instance, if this motor runs 100, at 8 volts. Well, if I'm only putting 1.2 volts out there, okay, 1.2, I'm going to get 10% of that. Um, yeah, I've got some value in here. This is going to be less than 100, but not zero. Because as my motor speeds up, my error is going down. And my output is my error times this constant. So when I flip the switch with 100 in here, or with 1 in here, I get 100. But as the motor speeds up, this value goes down and down and down. At some point, that value gets low enough that that output is what it takes for the motor to run that speed. And it's going to equalize right there. Now, I could put a higher value in here, and I'm going to get closer to my right speed. But something important to note here Let's say I indeed wanted this to 
uh, I wanted this to go 100. And I put some value in here, and all this is going on, and it finally gets, this gets to 100. So I have 100 right here. I told it to go 100. How much error do I have? Zero. I'm really happy, except for a small problem. What is zero times whatever my constant is? What is my output voltage to the motor? Well, it ain't going 100 then, is it? So what happens, as you use P, it is multiplying that value times the error and driving the output. The higher you make P, the closer your motor speed will get to what you told it to be, but it's never going to completely get there. It needs some error to drive the signal. Now, say, well, okay, I'm going to outsmart it. I'm going to put one million in there. Because I'm okay with 99.999 and 0 .0001 times a million gets me some energy in here to make the motor go. Okay? Well, here's what happens. Okay, I'm at zero. I put in 100, I have an error of 100, times a million is a freaking big number. This thing is at 12 volts. And I'm headed towards my right velocity and away I go. Okay, I'm now slowing down, so wait a minute, I'm in the next county. Because a million times even the smallest error is massive. You will say, okay, well, I've overshot, I'm headed back the other way. And I'm back to a million times something. I'm 900 miles an hour headed towards my goal. And by the time you get your ducks in a row, you are now in a different county in the other direction. There's a point where you crank P up trying to drive that error down where it can't ever stop at the right speed. It's just going after the goal too hard. That's the trade-off. You turn P up until you start to oscillate back and forth around the goal, and we're going to see that later with a real-life demo. That's why you can't completely drive all the air out of it with P. Now, one might ask, well, this P, I, and D thing, where on earth did this come from? That's a separate seven-hour discussion of how in all the control loop theory and all the world we've ended up here, but this is how everybody does it in the world. That one of the values you use and the math you use to control a loop is called proportional P, and it's the error times the value drives my output. I crank P up to drive my error down, but I can't ever get to zero or even really close to zero because that million number in there, I'm going to shoot right past my goal because I can't get slowed down quick enough. I got to slow down sooner as I approach my goal and I'm going to have a little bit of error where I'm at equilibrium, where I needed that error to drive the motor to run a speed that's close to my goal. So that's the P value in a closed loop. Does that make any sense to anybody? You get how this works? Yes? Oh, I was the okay, cool. All right. That's P. And suddenly this doesn't look so complicated, does it? Pretty simple math, my set point minus however fast the encoder says is my error times P gets shoved into this summer and that turns into a voltage coming out of the town. And that is exactly how it works. And what goes on then, that's what allows you to go up and down this curve. Now I'm running a given speed, I try to slow it down, that creates more error that multiplied by P gives me more output, and it pushes on it. Now, as it turns out, with only P, this line is not straight up and down. The more I load it, the more error I need to get the power, this line will actually be sloped. It won't be open loop, but that line will be sloped a little bit, because the more I load it, the more error I need to get that power out of it, and that's just P. That's the limitation of P. All right, so we're going to do a little demonstration here. Um, and this will give you a sense of these control loops and how they work. Because we're actually going to have a motor, and we're going to have an encoder, 
and we're going to mess around with gains, and we're going to mess around with how slow or how much delay we have in our encoders. So first of all, I need, let's say, four, actually we need five victims. We need five, and, and, and almost nobody's going to die. Yeah. And no one has to talk. So five people head down this way. We'll get somebody committed before they see me bring out the blindfold mask. Jerry, I think the pizza might be here soon, so just okay. FYI. And what we're going to do, whenever the pizza shows up, we will stop cold. Last year we stopped and the pizza was an hour late and we lit a bunch of time on fire. Okay. Who's got very good foot dexterity? Who runs track? Nobody. <laughs> All right, well, you're victimized anyway. Okay. You're the motor, and what you're going to do, your job is to stay on position and go down this line. Okay? And you're pretty good. You have a motor, your legs. You have an encoder, your eyes. You have a computer, your brain and heart and stuff to make all this work, and indeed you watch the line and away you go. But we just want him to be a motor. Right now he's a complete system. So we need to detune the encoder so there isn't an encoder. So we need you to put this on, and one of your friends is going to be your encoder. So, and actually your job is to not let him hit anything, because he's going to be blind. So you, in essence, are the hard stop in the talent, and if he's going to hit anything, you grab him and stop him, because he is going to be blind. All right. And when we tell you to go slow, in essence, low gain, you're just going to take your feet and do steps like that. When we tell you we're going to turn the gain up, and you're going to go faster, you're going to take a little bit bigger step, and you're going to move forward quicker. Okay? But you're blind, you're the motor. Okay? Who feels like an encoder? All right, you're the encoder. All right, so you stand over here right now. You're right here. You are now the encoder. This guy is going to watch where he's at. And the encoder is going to tell the talent and motor, kind of all in one, they're kind of a talent combined, what to do. And so, can you tell left from right? Now I ask that, I'm ambidextrous. I cannot tell left from right. You know left from right? Okay. All right. He is, when I say go, he's going to start walking, and you're going to tell him left or right. And what you're going to do, you're going to go slow, and when he says left or right, you're just going to tweak your direction a little bit, okay? So nice and slow, and the gain going this way is nice and slow. All right, so blindfold on. All right, when I say go, you take off, and anytime you think a correction is needed, you just say left or right, and then you correct. And you make sure he doesn't hit anything. You don't need a lawsuit. All right. Go. Right there. Right there. Go to the left. Right there. Right there. Go to the left. Go to the right. Left, 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 left. Right, right, right. right. There you go. End. All right. For the most part, he stayed on the line, didn't he? The encoder and the motor did its job. So let's come back here. We're going to do this again. And turns out our encoder is pretty low bandwidth. Our encoder is not giving us updates as often as we would like. So Mr. Encoder, all right, same job, except now you can't talk to him directly. You are going to tell him left or right, very softly in his ear. Okay? You are going to tell him left or right very softly in his ear. You are then going to tell him what to do, and you're going to go about the same pace you did. You guys have to be really quiet. You can actually say it loud enough for him to hear. Theoretically, it's the same deal. Same guy watching, same guy walking, and we've just added a little bit of delay into the information. So let's see what happens, and don't let him hit anything. <laughs> All right, so you guys want to get close so you can, can talk. All right, go. Left. Right. Left. 
<laughs> okay, what did we see happen? We were kind of in control, but we were oscillating about the answer. Now, what do you think would happen if there were 16 people in this row? Okay? He would be what we call banging off the walls. He would hit whatever is over here and eventually hit whatever is over here. And indeed, a control system can do that. This is what happens when the information off of your encoder is not as fast as it could be, or the velocity filters to try to get you a nice smooth number are slowing down when the data actually gets to the talent. If I slow down the data, I am vulnerable to the system oscillating. The faster I get the data directly to him, the better he can walk the line. And that's the encoder. Okay? So now we're going to do this a little bit differently. You're back to a fast encoder, so you're going to talk to him directly. Your job's going to get a lot more important. Uh, first of all, you're going to start right over here. Okay? We're going to say when we flip the system on, it wasn't running the right speed. And you're going to go a whole lot faster now. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay? And same goal, you've got to get him on the line and keep him there. And all you can really say is left and right. So, line fold on. And go. Left. Right. Left. 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 <laughs> so, similar problem. Direct encoder feedback, but my motor is a lot faster. It's going someplace in a big hurry. Both get you in trouble the same way. If I have very fast encoder feedback and my system can't get away from me in a hurry, think big inertia. It can't change speeds very quickly. I got time to figure out what's going on and get it back online. If I have a system that can change speed rapidly, I'm way out in the weeds before the encoder can tell the talent you've got to do something. And then if I've got a system that can correct very quickly, I'm correcting in a hurry and I overshoot and say, oh crap, now I've gone too far. And you end up oscillating. And there are really two levels of oscillation. There's one called a stable oscillation where you look and say, I'm not running the right speed exactly. I kind of am but I am jittering around my right speed. But it looks stable. It's going wrong, 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 wrong. But no smoke's leaking out. If I turn the gain up far enough, or the motor is powerful enough, or the encoder is slow enough, it becomes a positive feedback system, where it happens a little bit here. I say, oh, no, correct hard, OK. Oh, no, you're really screwed up. Correct hard, oh, OK. Oh, now you're just really messed up now. Really crank it the other direction. And the oscillation will grow and grow and grow until parts leave your robot at a high velocity or all the smoke leaks out of it. Um, how many folks remember the Strike for Stronghold robot? It was when the iron came up, we shot the ball through the goal. When that thing auto aimed, the arm would come up, it would find the goal, and we didn't have a turret, we pivoted the whole robot. And that was a tank drive that we were pivoting at a precision to put the ball in there. That loop was highly, highly tuned for one specific job at that speed turning to do that job. Those tuning values, even though it was speed control, we were controlling the speed of those wheels, it was tuned to do that exact job. On a particular Saturday when we were doing all of this, we tried something and it got away from us a little bit. And to give you an example how violent those oscillations can be, that robot weighed at 120 pounds. And there was a moment where it went unstable and started oscillating back and forth. And that thing had six sims driving it, where the lowest part of the robot is now that far off the ground. Um, it was a miracle we got it stopped before we got to rebuild the thing. These are high power systems with lots of motors. When you start cranking 100 amps into these motors, and the talons will do it, crazy stuff can happen. You've got to think about your current limit. You have to think about having bounds on this stuff. When you go closed loop, 
If you tell it to do something crazy, it's going to do something crazy. And it will do it to the limits. So pay attention, close loop. So, thank you all. Now you've seen the effect of motors, effect of encoders. There you go. And nobody died. Okay. Was that helpful? That gave you guys a sense of this loop stuff and how you get in trouble. Now, keep in mind here, this is happening way, way, way faster. But all the principles are the same. That is exactly what's going on. It's just happening way, way, way faster. If you reflect back to the P loop, and that's what we were doing here, if I make P pretty low, just really small, because I'm afraid of oscillation, the mentors are going to yell at me if I shed all the parts off the robot, I make P really low, what I get is this, and let's say my target is 1.1, actually No, this is not exactly correct. Anyway, so if I make P low, I'm going to approach my goal slowly, and I'm never actually going to get there. If I make P really high, I'm going to get there a lot quicker, but I might oscillate, and maybe it settles out, maybe it doesn't. If I make P higher, this thing now just gets this big and starts banging off the ceiling and floor. When I've got it about right, I get to my answer pretty quick. I might overshoot, but then it settles and ends up happy relatively quickly. And so when we talk about tuning, it is about getting that value right to get the response as ideal as possible. And you hear us talk a lot about step response. And one way to tune these things is say, I'm going 50. I'm going to instantly tell it to go to 100, and I'm going to look at that picture. And that picture tells me everything I need to know about is P too high, too low, how do I get this right? Other trivia question, uh, you know, tuning, also there's musical instruments to be tuned. Uh, anybody who was alive before, uh, let's say, 1980 can't answer. Um, you can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish. Why on earth would I put that on a slide? Trivia question for the end of the day. We will see uh, youngsters that were not alive previous to 1980. Where, where did this come from? You can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish. And in today's world of Google and Internet, if anybody doesn't get this right, I'm going to be disappointed. You have not learned how to use modern tools. Can't tune a fish. Notice the spelling on tuna. All right. So... We talked about proportional, we did a little demo, and you guys have a sense of how all that works. But proportional, because you can't turn it up so high to get rid of the majority of the error, because then you oscillate like crazy, it has a problem of there's always going to be some error. That if I need a lot of precision in my speed, I can't get there with proportional. So what do we do about that? Well, as you might have guessed, this is not the first time that discussion has come up in the history of the world, and there's a solution. And it's called the integral component. So now we've covered P, and now we're going to talk about I. So I's input is this exact same error. I's output gets shoved into this summer and goes to the output. So this doesn't care if it came from here or came from here. It adds all that up and outputs <coughs> voltage. This error is whatever comes out of that sum. So the way I or the integrator works, who said enough calculus, they know what integrals are. Oh, excellent. All right. Basically, that error value is a faucet into a bucket. And if there is some error, I'm going to open that faucet up. And the bigger the error, the more I'm going to open the faucet up. And so if I have a little bit of air, my bucket is going to be filling up slowly. And if, if I have a lot of air, my bucket's going to be filling up in a hurry. Now, let's say that I have had a little bit of air for a long time. 
and water's going in slow, but my bucket's pretty full. And this is magic water, it can be plus and minus, so you'll have to bear with me because otherwise the analogy doesn't work. So we can actually get to anti-water, where my, my bucket's pretty full, and something happens, my air is now slightly less than zero. And this magic faucet starts sucking water back out of the bucket. But my bucket is still pretty full. Even though my air is negative, my bucket is now getting less full, but it's still positive. There's still positive water in the bucket, even though the faucet is now sucking water out because my air is negative. So you have to think of the integral this way. We are integrating the error, and there is a cumulative integral value or bucket of water. So think of it as a bucket of water and a faucet putting water into and out of the bucket. The amount of open that faucet is, is the error. How much water is in that bucket is what I multiply by my I term and stick that into this summer. So think of a bucket of water. Air causes water to go into the bucket. More air, faster it goes in. If my air is negative, I'm sucking water out of the bucket. But the bucket's the bucket, and I can have some negative air, but previously my bucket was full, and that bucket is still positive, it's just now decreasing. So as you think about this, you're like, wow, you know, that thing takes a while to get caught up to what's going on, and that is the downside of the integrator. The upside is, because watch this, this gets really cool, with P, I get to where my system is stabilized, but I have a little bit of air here, and I have to. The air goes to zero, I have no output. With I, a little bit of air, my bucket keeps filling up, maybe slowly, but my bucket keeps filling up. And that bucket has water, not anti-water, water in it, it's full, to some level. I multiply that times k sub i, and the amount of water in that bucket times that value gives me my output. So here's what happens. P gets me close, and P's very quick. P's instant. Do you have some air? Bang, the output's right there. The integrator then says, okay, you have a little bit of air. I'm going to slowly start filling the bucket up because you have a little bit of air. The fuller that bucket gets, the more output I stuff here. So a little bit of air, bucket's filling up, my output's going up and up and up as my bucket fills up. How long does that bucket keep getting full? When does this stop? Well, guess what's eventually going to happen? That bucket, because it's integrating the air, is going to keep getting filled until this goes fast enough that my air is now zero. When my air is zero, what happens to the amount of water in my bucket? My faucet is closed because my air is zero. What is happening to the water level in the bucket? Absolutely nothing. It's now still. The integrator will continue to fill or empty the bucket until there's enough water in that bucket to drive the output to make the thing run the speed it's supposed to go. The integrator will drive your error to zero. P gets you there in a hurry, almost. The integrator cleans it up and actually gets you the precision. And those two in combination is what is called a PI controller, and that is used a lot. To where I dial my P up as high as I can without it oscillating, gets me close quick, and now I use P to clean up, or I'm sorry, I use I to clean up the rest. I's not quick. I theoretically I could do this whole job with I, because you say, well, why do you have P? Just turn that off. Turn on I. That bucket is going to keep filling up until I finally have enough water in it to drive my output to get to my right speed. And when I'm at my right speed, my air is zero, my bucket is stable. And I'm just going to sit there. And that will absolutely work. You can do a pure eye controller. And all you need is the math and about a week's worth of lunch, because that's how long it's going to take for that thing to ever stabilize. 
way too slow. If it turns out you have a millennium and you don't know what else to do, you indeed could just do an eye control. But in first, by the time your robot actually got up to speed, three matches have happened, and uh, you're going to need some pee in there to make that thing respond quickly. So P gets you there quickly and close, I cleans up the rest, and think of it as the air is a faucet dumping water into a bucket. The amount of water in that bucket times my I value is how hard I drive the output. So, I cleans up the rest, P does the heavy lifting. If you didn't have P, it would take forever to get there. Okay? All right. Well, then what on earth do we need D for? This was just fine. We didn't need to add any more math. As it turns out, you get P all tuned up to where you are headed to your answer as fast as you can. You've got I in there to clean up the air. But if you reflect back, I can still overshoot a little bit and then get to my right answer. <coughs> D, the differentiated factor, it's a differentiator, takes the rate of change of the error. The rate of change and gives you an output. Think of the error as a slope on a graph. If my error is not changing, my D output is zero. If my error is changing rapidly, D is the slope of that error change. So I take my error, I differentiate it, which turns that into a slope, and I multiply that by a value. The reason you do this is if my system is stable, D isn't doing anything. I's got things cleaned up and I'm happy. If I need a quick step change, he's right there. The moment I have a big error, boom, he's right there. I then cleans it up. But you have problems where as I tune this as hot as I can to get to my answer quickly, I will have a tendency to overshoot my answer and have to come back. You start dialing some D in to do a soft approach. D is specifically watching what rate of speed am I headed towards my goal? And I know if I'm going that fast, I'm going to overshoot the runway. So D will watch, in essence, your rate of descent and say, you're descending too fast. Slow down your rate of descent, or you're going to smash right into the runway. And once again, if it was a magic runway, you'd go through it and be underneath the runway. Turns out, in the aircraft world, you just crash. Um, so D helps you with a soft landing getting to your answer. Now, you turn D up far enough, and the whole system goes, geez, I got a big error. I need to get over there, and D just won't let me go anywhere. Because as soon as I have any slope to diminishing my error, D is right there because I've made it really big, saying, oh, no, you don't. The steeper your slope, the more I'm going to turn down your output. That's probably another thing. D is inverted. The steeper my slope, the faster I'm approaching my answer, the more D throttles it down. And so what that does is stabilize the approach. And D is primarily a tool to address overshoot when P and I are too hot and it will ring. You saw here there was a scenario by which we would be off and eventually maybe you could get right. D would actually help you say, hey, you're headed over there way too freaking fast. Slow down. All right, now you're getting closer. I have less air. I'm going to turn D down as I get over there, and poof, I'm going to stop right where I want to go. And you're going to see a great live tuning demonstration of D. So there you go, P, I, D. And they will spend an entire semester in college teaching you exactly this. Now, you might imagine there's a whole lot of interesting math here when it comes to modeling all this stuff without doing it in the real world. Luckily, in first, we have to actually build a robot. You don't have to model it. You can build it and try it and see what really happens. So P, I, and D. Everybody got that? Everybody understand why all three values serve a purpose? OK? All right. Just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water, something else shows up. 
So what on earth is feed forward? And more importantly, why is it wired over here instead of the air? Well, here's why. Let's say, for instance, I want to do velocity control on my motors that are driving my robot down the field. Okay? I don't have to know what my air is to know I'm going to need something more than zero to make that robot go. I might not know exactly how much it takes to run at half speed, but I know it's not zero. And so as it turns out, there's some amount of value given the system that you can just assume I'm going to need at least this much. If I want to run across the floor at 10 feet per second, well, I'm probably going to need at least this much voltage going to the motor, and that normally would get me to 9 feet per second, depending on the drag on the carpet and I'm going uphill, downhill, who knows. But I might as well at least assume I need enough voltage to go at least 9 volts. I don't need PID to help me with that. I know I'm sitting still, and I know I need something to get going. This is what F does. And so feed forward is saying, hey, you told me to go 10 feet per second. I don't need to do any math. I know you need at least 6 volts to do that. The PID loop will figure out if you need it a little bit more than that, but you need at least 6 volts. So I'm just going to give you 6 volts right now, and you're going to head towards that, and now the PID loop takes over, finishing up the rest of the air. Now, why do you do this? Because you do the heavy lifting with F. F covers most of the output you need, and guess what? F is instant, and F is stable. There's no feedback loop here. I told it to go 10 feet per second. I've got some math. That's the output. That can never oscillate. And what it does is it reduces the load on the PID map. Because now the PID map is cleaning up a much smaller error. And that's the big reason you do that. And you can be a lot more aggressive with your values if you are not correcting such a big error. So you do a lot of your heavy lifting with F, and we're going to do that today. Then you dial in PI and D to put the precision in it, and you can make PI and D much more aggressive with some F in there. And that gets you a much faster response. Now, you might say, well, gee, how fast does it really have to go? Um, that shooter for those balls, ball hits that thing, you have 100 milliseconds to have that wheel back at exactly the right speed. And on that shooter on the encoder, a single tick on the RPM, I mean, that thing ran at about 500 ticks per tenth of a millisecond. A single tick, if it was running 501, that's an inch of distance on the goal. If it's at 5010, the ball doesn't hit the goal, it's out the back side. That's how important speed control was on that. So you had 100 milliseconds to have that thing right dead nuts on. And all this stuff matters in a case like that. Now, if you're driving down the floor in velocity, does it need to be all that exact in any given moment? No, the driver will figure out what he needs to do. And so you can be way sloppier on most of this stuff. But on something like that, you end up right against the limit of what you're doing. So, the way you tune these, you tend to use feed forward to get myself close. And then you do P, then you do I, and then you determine if you need D. And you do those one at a time. You'll build some experience knowing what the waveforms look like when I've gone too far. And the great news is they all interact. So once you mess with I, even though you may have thought you had P optimized, now that you're messing with I, eh, there might be a new optimal value for P. And it is a process that will drive you crazy. At the end of the presentation, there is a, I suppose, idiot's guide to OK. If you've got 10 minutes before the plane crashes and you've got to tune a PID loop, here's the process that should get you to something that is stable and works and you can fine tune from there. So there is a guide at the end of this that you'll all go home with on do these seven steps and you'll be okay. After that, then, yes, take your time and spiffy it up, but you can get a loop up and going. So that is it. That is the big deal. That is what's going on inside of the talent. You have F. P, I, and D.
Now, there is also something called I-Zone, but we are going to wait until that problem blows up. And just know, when a big problem happens, you're going to say, now what do we do about it? Your answer should be I-Zone. So foreshadowing the things to come. All right, any questions about this? Cool. All right, if I were to graph getting to the right answer using different combinations of these, with P optimized, and I'm trying to get to 1, I approach it pretty quickly, but I need some error to have some P value, so I can't ever get to 0. I, I actually can get there. I can go to 0. But OK, I'm filling my bucket up. I'm filling my bucket up. I still have some error, so I'm still filling my bucket up. So I'm still throttling up. And I am throttling up until my error goes to zero. Now the problem is, my bucket's pretty full. My bucket stopped getting full the moment I crossed zero, but I've got too much water in my bucket. So now I go past, and I say, oh, I'm too fast now. Now I start taking water out of the bucket. And I start throttling back until eventually I would cross it the other way. And so what will happen with I, with a pure I controller, is it will ring and oscillate forever, and somewhere on the back wall, maybe it finally stabilizes. That's why you can't do the whole job with I. It takes forever. All right, you combine P and I, and look what happens. I get to my answer pretty quick. I do overshoot a little bit, because there's a little I problem, but it does quickly stabilize, and I am at where I needed to be, okay? Now let's say I add D, what can I do? You know what? Turns out once you add some D, I can take P up a lot higher. I could really be aggressive at getting to the answer, and D is going to save me from overshooting. So with PI and D, it starts to look like this. Literally, instantly, I'm at the right answer. I don't overshoot or undershoot. I'm there and I'm stable. That's why you do PI and D. P does that. PI does that. I alone does that. Pack of lunch. And PI and D does that. There are times you can also do a PD controller where you get there very quick, but there's no I, so I'm going to have a little bit of error. The azimuth control on that robot, while it's motion magic, is a PD controller. The P is so high that the error is acceptable, and we don't put any I in it to help stabilize the system. And we'll see that here in a demo. So that's a graph that can help remind you what this stuff does.